Hello, 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 hello. It's good to see you. Say hello. Welcome. The Husky Sox Podcast, Weldy and Andrew, uh, here to recap another uh, exciting weekend of Husky Hockey. Uh, but, but first, I hate to start off a show uh, with a with with a correction. Um, you know, normally I'm not wrong on things, uh, which is pretty much uh, very rarely. well documented. Yes. Yeah, yeah, just. Um, but every once in a while, when I am, I, I want to make sure you done messed up, A.A. Ron. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna own up to it. So, um, so I I will still stand by the fill the herb event from last week for the women's team. Um, that it wasn't promoted very well, but they did have autographs for the men's team beforehand. So they had autographs for the men's team beforehand because they were off. Um, and then they had autographs afterwards, which I should have actually just kind of put together um, because there was a line of chairs and about 20 some uh, chairs that I told my kids to stop climbing on. Uh, but um, I didn't realize that the autograph portions um, and the time frames of everything um, until my wife actually sent me, she works with Centure Care, and she sent me a little snip up of, hey, it's Phil the Herb Night um, on Monday after the event happened. <laughs> so um, it was uh, just uh, still stand by that. But, um, you know, it, it was just kind of the whole event, I think. Still could have been planned uh, maybe a little bit better, uh, a little bit more um, f- advertising um, along with it. But uh, still, uh, I-, I like them doing some things. I like them having beer at the events, uh, as my wife and I did partake. Um, you can question my parenting choices all you want. As I said, I had to tell them to stop climbing at my kids to climb on chairs um, after I had a beer. But, um, you know, don't judge. Um, but, uh, yeah, this weekend at the Gopher game, um, and we'll get into that, uh, but, uh, no beer, uh, was to be had, but I, I did, um, <laughs> I, I, I did kind of get chirped at by the, the women's scratches for Minnesota, but we'll, we'll get, we'll get to that, um, during yes. the recap p- portion. So, uh, let's hop, uh, right into, uh, recap for, uh, Colorado college. And, uh, we got a little bit of a little segment here. Andrew put something together. So let's, uh, let's get to the recap. A big conference matchup between the Huskies and the Tigers in Colorado Springs. Friday's night's opener sees the Huskies get on the board first, discovering that yes, you can score on the power play as Werner Mietnan knocks in a rebound just nine seconds into the game's first power play. Tyson Gross would double the lead just two minutes and change into the second period, intercepting a bad breakout pass and sneaking it behind Caden and Barico. Tigers get on the board with a power play tally of their own at 7.04 of the second, with D-man and leading scorer Ty Gallagher solving the Huskies' stout penalty kill. But the Huskies would answer back just a few minutes later with another power play goal of their own as Austin Brnovic does a little fancy whoop, whoop, roofs a backhand over in Barico to make it 3-1 to one after two periods. Would the Huskies vanquish their season-long third-period blues on Friday? No, no, they would not. Just five shots in the period for the Huskies, and CC gets one goal closer after pulling in Barico with three minutes left. With the extra attacker, it's Max Burkholter getting his fourth goal on the year. Huskies gotta sweat another one out. But Isaac Posh makes some big saves, and the Huskies hold on 3-2. Tigers outshoot the Huskies 27-17, but the good guys win the opener. And on to Saturday night, where the Huskies were going for their eighth series sweep in Colorado Springs in the NCHC era. Posh and Embarico lock horns in a classic goalie duel. Scoreless after the first period. Scoreless after two. All zeros again after the third period. To clown hockey we go, and it's Philippe Blaise Savoy with the top shelf laser with 101 to go in overtime to win the game 1-0 for CC. Tigers again held the shot advantage over the Huskies at 35-27 and dominate in the faceoff dot 34-19, but the Huskies do get an extra point and take 4 out of 6 points in the Springs. 
Yeah. Perfect. You, hey, I, I like I like how that sounded. We got some production quality going on now. Andrew, you're 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 kind of the main guru when it comes to that. You got the great sounders from the Wisconsin rule and yeah, it's well, I'm in all we can of your get talent. to those. Yeah, we'll get to those more. Those, those are more second half of the year sounders. Uh the yeah. pairwise probability matrix is a fun one. Oh, yeah, uh, but uh, this was something, uh, an idea that I had. Let me know if you think it's a good idea, if it's a bad idea. Um, thought it'd be a good way to to set the table here for our our award winning analysis of. of we are a serious podcast and, you know, we demand to be taken seriously. That's right. Just like uh, the Magicians Alliance in Arrested Development. <laughs> that is seasons correct. one through three. That is Not anything correct. past that. So um, this is going to be an interesting series to recap. And I, uh, I don't, I, I don't know how you feel. So I'm going to toss it over to you. I feel like this weekend was kind of a weird nothing burger. If if you could say, I don't think anything really stood out to me in a huge positive sense. Um, in a, and, and like, I, I guess I didn't really move the needle on where I think the team is, so to, so to speak. So um, what, what did you kind of think of overall of how they played out in Colorado Springs? I think that's a fair analysis. Um, but being a, a conference road series against a what's seeming to be a competitive team in CC, getting four out of six points, I think, is just fine. I mean, I, I wasn't blown away by the Huskies. I wasn't blown away by CC this weekend. Uh, and so getting out of there with the majority of points and not playing your best hockey, I think is, is it, it, you could have done a lot worse. I'll put it that way. Yeah, but that's true. That Saturday game, uh, I have to admit, I was nodding off. Uh, it was, yeah, if you're going to, tell someone to get into hockey, bring them to a game. And that's the game you bring them to. I apologize. Cause it was, it, it, it was tough to stomach at times. It was the, the pacing itself and the, uh, um, it, it, it just didn't do, it didn't do a lot to light a light, a passionate fire. And I just, I wasn't tense throughout the whole time. It was just like, it, it was like waiting for something to happen. There were chances. I mean, there are, CC had, I mean, Laba had two breakaways by himself. Uh, and then there was a couple of odd man rushes that mostly C- CC had. I mean, there's a couple great A's for the Huskies as well. But for the most part, not much action to to uh, talk about. I always feel like a, a zero zero game after regulation. It's kind of like a bug in the system. Like if you were in inventing a game or a sport from scratch and it came to the point where you played an hour of game time and no points were scored you'd probably be like i gotta go back to square one here something is something's wrong this, <laughs> something's this can't fishy. it can't work like this uh, and even with the one nothing goal based on clown hockey not satisfying again you you get an rpi benefit from going to overtime but uh you know, in some sense, in the pairwise with common opponents and head to head, this goes down as one and one weekend, which I have thoughts about. I've made that my annoyance of that system clear the inconsistency between RPI and the other criteria for pairwise. Like I said, for for conference points, um, from that perspective, it is clear that the Huskies got the majority of points this weekend, which is what I was hoping for the uh, for the series, and uh, you know, no regulation no no five on five goals given up this weekend for the huskies um you had a power play goal on friday and an extra attacker goal and then the three on three goal i think that's impressive another very good weekend for posh um matched wits with with Imberico, um two excellent goaltenders and obviously with the zero zero game through regulation uh that's evident just by the score itself uh also keeping, I mean, CC's never going to blow anyone away based on their offense, but there are three goals this weekend that I just mentioned, um, none of which were on five on five. All of those were scored by defensemen as well. So 
Laba had a couple of assists, but largely contained him. Uh, and the fact that their scoring depth isn't much to sneeze at was it was evident. But the same same time from the Huskies' standpoint, shut out on Saturday. That's never good. Um, good things though. We've got the power play awakened somewhat with two power play goals on Friday. Uh, I, I, I know what you're going to say though. Those weren't the, uh, yeah, yeah. how you really draw them up, especially now, the, Bernab- now, the Bernabit goal. The, the first one, I would say, yes, yes. I, I think that was, that was a good setup. That was a good tip out in front. It really mirrored also promise burger goal, um, that happened on Friday, um, against Minnesota yeah. too. It was kind of the same type of play. A beautiful, like, okay, we set something up. We, we scored on a tip and you know, that that's what, what I want to see on the power play. Uh, the second, the Bernovic one, um, that was after an odd man rush shorthanded that we gave up, um, that, uh, we were able to stand tall on Bernovic goes down and really kind of looks off and pretends to pass defender totally bites on it. Um, and, uh, just a goal scorer's goal. And it was just one of those goals that, you know, kind of like, um, his goal against, uh, Miami, where he was able to go kind of, you know, past the goal line and kind of t- come back and tuck it in. It's one of those that's like, this is a special player we're watching. Yeah. He might be here a year. He might be here two years, but this is going to be a player. It's like, we, we want to soak up every moment we have with him um, because he is something special. Um, and it, it's fun when those players are here. Um, Cause St. Cloud, you know, as, as we do get some talent um, here, you know, Prospects like this don't come around very often here to St. Cloud State. So it's um so so that was good to see, but that was goes down as a record on the power play goal. That's nice for the percentage. Um that creeps up a little bit, but at the same time, that's not your traditional power play no. goal. And um there were other power plays um on the weekend, especially that Saturday game that looked really rough. Just one chance on Saturday for the Huskies. Yeah. It's two for four on the weekend, which hey, fifty percent uh looks good percentage wise, as you mentioned. Really only one of those was kind of how you traditionally draw it up on a power play, and that only lasted the nine seconds. Uh, but efficiency. Hey, it's it's better than nothing. Uh, we'll, we'll take it. Uh, and even like I was pleasantly surprised to see Litke get some action on the power play. I've been kind of mentioning pref- preferring him to guys like Wiley uh, on the power play. Litke, I believe, was who took that shot that uh, Werner was able to clean up the rebound to score the, the first goal on Friday. Um, and so good to see some some willingness to to shuffle around some personnel uh, on the power play. The other big uh, glaring weakness that's uh, afflicted this team for the first uh, six weeks or so, third period play, uh, didn't see the improvements uh, in that yeah. in that category this weekend with still zero goals in both games. Five shots on Friday, four on Saturday. Um, and the Friday game, you have the two-goal lead. There's, you know, I thought the first 10 minutes, it's not like CC. It's It, it was not evident that St. Cloud was on their back keel and in a dull stall type of situation. But really, the, the last 10 minutes was more like that than when CC gets their second goal with the extra attacker. Still had about two and a half minutes to go after they made it through to two. Posh had to come up uh, with some big saves there at the end to to seal the deal too close for comfort. I, I almost feel like you go back to that game up in Bemidji where similar situation leading three to one going into the third period and Gardner had a gold opportunity to make it four to one really salt that game away. It seems like it, it, well, I'd like to think of a butterfly effect. If that goal goes in, <laughs> then we're not talking about these third period struggles for the, for the rest of the season since then, because I believe it's a big difference between three and three uh, up three to one versus four to one, not saying at four to one, you can go into it all stall, but just a big difference between a two goal cushion and a three goal cushion, because you have to expend all that extra energy to, to get through the rest of that game on Friday. I'm not saying that that was the difference in laying a goose egg on Saturday, but the feeling of having to, to sweat all these wins out 
and expend all the energy you have um, just to get through the 60 minutes, you know, that tends to compound throughout, throughout a season. So, you know, just being able to put teams away to a much better degree than they have so far this year uh, is I mean, it's, it's more important the, the longer we go this season. So I, I really would mm-hmm. like to see that, that get cleaned up because it's, it's still an issue for sure. Yeah, it's it's almost like we get the puck in our own end and we just try to flip it out and just chip it out, like get it out by any means necessary. Um, And it's sometimes that even just causes more issues um, as as well. Those failed clearing attacks, those extra chances. And CC is a team where I think they're a very opportunistic team, um, where as you know, when, when they create those chances, they do have the horses that can, you know, kind of burn you. And all of a sudden it's in the back of your net. Um, you know, like, uh, Varenyev, uh, Lava, Cooley, you know, all of those guys. Yeah. They've got that ab- ability to do that. And when you're kind of hitting the panic button, it's hot potato. When you've got the puck in your own end, um, you know, trying to shell into that lead and, try to chip it out it's it doesn't take too long before uh they can capitalize on that now i will say on friday that i think they probably tried that a little bit too much i was actually on friday's game i was happy with the pressure and the four check that the huskies did do i thought they were aggressive in the first two periods gross's uh goal in general was one that was just right off of a turnover off of an errant pass. Um, I feel like CC tends to get maybe a little bit too cute uh, with the puck. And then, you know, if you're able to really capitalize on those chances, I don't think they're going to be a dangerous team. I would say, like, I, I don't expect them against the upper echelon of national collegiate hockey conference or even NCAA when it comes tournament time, those mistakes are going to end up burning you um, against really good teams. Yeah. You can get away with it and, and, you know, against air force like you did earlier this year, but against uh, some of the top teams, they're going to end up burning you. Um, And on Friday it did end up burning them. So that's, uh, that's, that's kind of a little bit about um, the CC. Uh, I thought, defensively i thought we did well we did give them the wings um a little bit too much space i think uh it ended up working out in our favor so maybe i should just shut up about it but i i feel like cc was really trying to use their speed to get past every once in a while i thought our defenseman was a little bit flat-footed but i am um, i think they were really trusting posh also if you're going to give them that angle posh is going to end up making the save uh it didn't uh, end up happening on that three on three. Uh, but that was also just kind of a heck of a snipe and the way that went in and out, I thought it hit the crossbar. Um, I, yeah, I didn't think that's why I in. thought it that went in real time, but it was, it was clear yeah. that it was in the back of the net. It was clear. Yeah, it was clear. Yeah. The, I first do the, uh, you, you done messed up, uh, sounder. I don't know if you have your button by there. You right done now. messed up. Hey, hey Ron. 10 shots on goal for St. Cloud in the third period on Saturday. I was looking at their misreading the box score. They had four shots in the second period on Friday and then five in the third. So the, their third period was, uh, at least from a shots on goal perspective, they had more shots in the third than they did in the second, even though they scored the two goals in the second period there. But, um, you know, talking about special teams, you know, penalty kill has been very good this year. They killed off five out of six this weekend. I, did notice though so the two penalties that Gardner takes on Friday and those were both offensive zone penalties yeah um big momentum sw- swings especially you're up two nothing and then you take a penalty like that get CC back in the game uh you like to think that those are avoidable Ingram does the same on Saturday early in the game and Ryman as well takes another offensive zone penalty I believe it's four out yeah. of the six penalties were all were offensive zone penalties which it's great that the penalty kill has been as good as they have this year, but uh, really feel like that that contributed to the the play this weekend were, were CC on a whole. I don't think they dominated per se, but on a whole, they were out shooting the Huskies, uh, especially on Saturday, really well in the faceoff dot. Uh, 
those kind of things with special teams, especially with St. Cloud only getting the one power play chance on Saturday, feeling like you never love to take penalties, but there there is a good penalty to take. Ones in the offensive zone are, are, are don't fall in that category. Nope. Yeah, rarely that. Ingram too. I want to mention him. I, I thought he was <laughs> he was bad on Friday. I thought he was oh. better. I thought he was better on Saturday with that offensive zone penalty aside. He at least I'll I'll, I'll say this. He he played less timid on Saturday. Like I, at Friday, I'm like he's got to be hurt. And at this point, he's not doing himself any favors because this is really. This is not doing his prospects with nobody. With nobody is winning. Nobody. nobody is winning with Ingram on the ice right now. Right. And like, I'm only, like, I'm only bringing up the Saturday slight improvement because I'm grasping for something because again, with zero points uh, on the year, he's not helping his pro prospects. He's not helping the team, frankly. Uh, it's just a lose lose for everybody. And maybe if I see a little bit of improvement on Saturday, that means he's, in a breakthrough here, I do think it's if it's not physical, I think partly it's mental at this point because he's he's compounding on his mistakes, I think, with a lack of confidence. And that's something that can can come back once you get the monkey off your back. But we're a third of the way through the season here. And a guy that we had big expectations for the season as being one of your top scorers is buried on the death chart. And when he does get ice time, it's ineffective. I mean, it's to a point where I'm almost accepting this to be the new normal with Ingram. And I really hope that, uh, that he turns it around. Yeah. It's, you know, Friday, he looked listless out there. It's kind of the best, like, I don't, I don't know what it was, but he just looked like he wasn't engaging and it was just, he kind of just looked lost and it was like, what is like, like at this point, yeah, I'd, you know, a coin brings something to the table right now. Um, I, I don't know that Ingram does. Um, and it's, you know, you're going to give him the benefit on the doubt on Saturday. I, I think only really saying that a little bit. It, too it, call. it is charitable, I think, but it's just yeah. in, in relative to his other performances this year, especially on Friday, there is that sequence early in the game, first period on Friday in the defensive zone where CC was kind of pelting uh, posh with chances. And Ingram is just standing around. He's not moving. He's stationary um, and timid. Like I said, that's, that's the best word I can describe his play. And if he's going to play like that in the defensive zone, I, he's a liability on this team at this point. So um, really, really hope to see that. And again, from what I'm assuming, and I hope that it's injury related, uh, because that would at least explain, like you, you just don't go from a 30 point player to zero overnight without there being some underlying issue. So I would assume that is something in it, but if it's not, if it is, or if it's not, give me Jack Rogers, give me Ethan, a yeah. coin, give me somebody else on this team that can That's step hungry in. to be out there right so it, it's just another weekend where yes I, I feel like i saw a little bit of improvement but it's still not enough and another reason like again one nothing loss in overtime you just pop one past americo uh in regulation and, and you come out with a six point weekend it's a it's a big difference you hate to to lose games like 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 you did on saturday uh, and so missed opportunity, but the same sense, like I said, four points out of six, that really is, if you, if you do the, uh, lowest common denominator, that is two out of three ain't bad. Like meatloaf said, so I can't complain too much. Have you listened to bad out of hell too recently? I, I, by the I, way, this is not, um, I haven't listened to it recently, but <laughs> This is not an understatement. I grew up on that album. I, I yeah. really didn't know what Bad Out of Hell 1 was because I was more familiar with Bad Out of Hell 2, which we wore that cassette tape out <laughs> from front to back. Uh, from uh, I Would Do Anything for Love to Objects in the Rear View Mirror may appear closer than they are. The uh, epics starting and ending that album. Then you got things like Life is a Lemon and I Want My Money Back. Right. Yeah, Life I mean, is a Lemon and bangers. I Want My Money Back. No skips. No skips. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, I think I, I don't know. I 
said this not too long ago, but I was like, hey, you know, I know I'm 30 some years too late on this, but it, 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 is, it is a wonderful album. And you've, so. you've dabbled in the videos as well. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. The object in the rearview mirror, it, if I would were to watch it today, I'm sure I would cry. It's yeah. it's it's a it's a tear that one i don't know if i don't know if i've seen that one so well it's like a 15 minute song so it's 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 got a narrative to it and uh it's um milo doesn't do anything without a narrative it's gotta it's it's a journey it's gonna drive a point home might have some Um, phil rizzuto play by play involved yeah Uh, (laughs) it's a little bit of everything uh (laughs) r.i.p to a legend and yeah exactly (laughs) and what a throw um it's oh and i think i've actually mentioned this on the podcast but he did a wonderful rendition of um it's all coming back to me now by Celine Dion. You, you have mentioned that yes yeah <laughs> so it's on it's on youtube um but he wanted that song so bad but um i think the person who wrote the song was like no a woman's got to sing it so uh, but he still put it and it's out there it's obviously it's incredibly good because it's meatloaf so um but you know Take a step back. Zamora kind of called me out um, a little bit uh, yesterday saying that I'm a little bit, you know, and maybe both of us are a little bit too harsh on a team that overall is what eighth in the pairwise or too early. wherever we're too early for the pairwise. <laughs> that's your, that's your bit. Actually. That is my bit. Um, but, um, you know, this is kind of another weekend where maybe I am a little bit too harsh. I do want to praise the defense. I thought the defense, obviously, if, uh, you're not allowing a goals, um, through regulation and it's only a heck of a shot through clown hockey, uh, gets past posh. I think, um, the defense overall played incredibly well. Um, I thought also, I, I know we don't talk about him too much on the, on the podcast, but I thought Reiners had a strong game. Um, on especially on saturday and i was uh, what i was presently surprised with is some of the big names you didn't hear a lot of especially on friday i didn't hear zachariah wisdom's name called very often um and anytime you're not hearing his name called i think you're doing a pretty good job um um out there and uh, so just overall i think from that type of a structured play i think this was probably the best defensively we've looked all year. Um, and then again, Posh coming up huge when he had to. Um, I think both of the goals that uh, he gave up, um, you kind of shrug your shoulders and tip your cap, fish the puck out of the neck and say, let's let's drop the puck and get ready for it. So it's um, I, I just want to give kudos to them because I know sometimes I'm a little bit harsh. Um, um, when it comes to defense and defensive coverage, uh, well, any thoughts on that? I, I did want to come back to Gardner. I forgot about the point I was going to make about Gardner, but go ahead with that. Anything on the defense. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know. I'm not a fan of that goaltender interference call. Um, I feel like he was kind of pushed into it and he looks like he tried to stop. Um, I didn't see the cross check at all. Um, so that cross check for the, for his second penalty. So I don't know if it's just him. He's a bigger guy. So he's going to get the benefit of the doubt of getting a penalty called on him, uh, that if that's going to be the case, then he has to be aware of that. Uh, but I don't know. I just, I just felt like, especially that goaltender interference one, I thought that was a weak call. I wasn't surprised by it. The, the bull rush move going to be called and St. Cloud's going to get the beneficiary of getting power plays with plays like that, that some guy gets runs into posh in a similar uh, style. So, I mean, I wasn't surprised that they called it. Um, and I, yeah, I, I, I agree. It's, it's not my favorite call in the world, but I, because it's called, like you, you've got to be aware of the fact that, don't try to put yourself in that position to the to the point where the referee and I think at that point too, I think the refs wanted to make a call. Like two nothing lead for the Huskies. You kind of feel yeah. like the next penalty is gonna be CC's. You know, don't put yourself in the position where they can call that that penalty on you. So I don't I realize it's not a ton that he can do at that point, but um was not surprised that they called it that way. But I do think also Gardner 
gets the penalty for the cross checking, and then I also don't think it's a coincidence that you get your maybe a little bit of your uh, your makeup call uh, a little bit later when Cooley gets a, a cross checking penalty called as well. So I do feel like it's one of those things that's like up. Uh, it ended up evening out. So all told, I mean, it was six power plays for CC and four for the Huskies, and some of those, as you mentioned, were not full full two minute stretches or some overlap for that perspective, 10 penalties in two games. And this was a good weekend for NCT refereeing. I guess (laughs) I'm saying I don't be, I, because I don't want to be the guy that only talks when they're, when they're terrible. This was a, they were largely invisible. There was, there was more penalty calls in one play of the Miami Omaha series. (laughs) Um, really was, where, was there i i didn't watch a ton of that on especially the saturday it was, it was oh very much on hand was there a brouhaha really you, you you didn't watch the barn burner hockey of omaha against miami shocker i know yeah exactly uh no um everyone on the ice got a 10 minute uh unsportsmanlike Ooh, conduct wow. penalty. Yeah, I'm seeing it and pulling up the box score now <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah, Miami uh 13 penalties for 66 minutes and UNO 11 penalties for 70 minutes. So, in that 8 to 1 uh slugfest. Um looks like it was just a minute or two after UNO made it six rip. Hey, uh Miami got on the board a couple minutes after that, so got, gave them a little bit of momentum. God, yeah, yeah, yeah. Noreen is getting his uh getting his licks in and showing what the Miami hockey can do. If anything, like how Omaha and Duluth last weekend for that matter handled Miami these past two weekends. It that five out of six it, weekend doesn't look so hot. Yeah, it's it, it's not great and that we were able to kind of squeak away with five points on that one and getting back to Zamora guilty is charged me not being the biggest pom-pom waiver for the Huskies and being a little Nick negative when it comes to a nine and four team uh yeah I I accept that Uh, I've I've seen better from this program uh just making the tournament isn't good enough for me and these results yes they're wins but it's not like we're blowing anybody out of the water uh, and it's not I, like we're looking incredibly good doing. I mean, I'm not even asking for blown out of the water. Just like, just look better out there. <laughs> and I just feel like we're not. Yeah, I want to come here. Come on, like remember that Miami weekend from a couple years ago when it was what eight to one and eleven to nothing or whatever it was. Go back to that. I I trust that I was very positive that weekend. Yeah, they get the ghosts of Patrick Newell back out here is what you're saying. And <laughs> he was long gone after that. That was that was in our run of the pod, the second run of the podcast. Oh, that would have been. Oh, was that in the second one? That was the first two. Maybe I was thinking of a uh, CC. Yeah, there, well, there's a lot, a lot of those kind of those kind of weekends back in those. I days. remember I got into a Twitter. I wouldn't say argument with Schlossman about it, but I think he said that. Uh, I can't remember. Somebody from North Dakota should have got first team. And I asked them because like anytime I'm saying blank should have got first team. I always say replacing who like, 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 okay. If you're, if if you're going to put something up there, you got to bump someone off. So put your name by who you bump off. And um, I think, I think Sloshman said Kosala that year. And I'm like, what he was the leading like he was the leading scorer and his point was that Kosala had too many points against CC in Miami and <laughs> like that was a negative it was like if you look at just the top teams he wasn't as effective as um I, I can't remember who it was uh, I, I Besser maybe I, I, it uh, could have been, been that Besser. year maybe that they wanted Kajula probably one of those yeah. guys no. Well, I'll so be sure I, to hold that uh, that argument against him based on whoever North Dakota's got that they <laughs> they racked up their points against Robert Morris, but they had to struggle to beat them. So oh, they really had to struggle to beat Bobby Mo. So, but um, uh, for your pow, uh, who do you have? So I'm gonna go posh. I will say for a forward, I wanted to mention I thought the best forward this weekend was Tyson Gross. Uh, 
he speaking of like mentioning CC with no five on five goals uh, in the weekend, only one for the Huskies. And that was that nice play where Gross read the uh, ill-advised clearing attempt by the CC defender, picked it off and uh, fired it past the Uh but he, all weekend, I, f- I feel like he was making good reads like that. Obviously not scoring any other goals, but he was uh, very active uh, in the ice. I felt like he was one of their best players. So uh, I, I should say, too, with the, again, it's clown hockey. I don't want to overanalyze it. Does Larson just pick players out of a hat? <laughs> it feel, when I saw Rosborough out there, I was like, what are we doing? I think it was it was gross. Which is good, but there's Gross, Ashan, and Litke, I think, that started Litke. it. That started, yep. Burnovic only got one shift. Well, um, and then Gross, Gross and Burnovic were out there. I was like, okay, this makes sense. You um, feel like there that, was more, there, there'd be pairings from their regular lines, but it seemed like whoever, like the two forwards that were going out were not line mates, or at least not line mates in, from, that, from that game. And it's strange to me, if you're going to do that, if you're going to go against what your regular lines are, you know, put, I think Hall and Burnovic were out there at one point, but like put some, put, put your more t- most talented guys out there. I, it feels like he's just trying to get through overtime and I, I don't quite understand yeah. it. Um, and so that was baffling to me. I, he's just not a, I don't think he, 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 he doesn't like three on three as much as we don't like three on three. Apparently. <laughs> but like I said, it's, it, it can be a big result that you weren't able to at least get out of there with a the tie, but, um, but gross getting back to the pow. I liked gross, but posh. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can't say enough about him. I think this is the third weekend I've given him the pow. Um, I know there's probably other weekends that I could have given him, given it to him as well. He's at this point, again, all right, if you want to accuse me of being too negative, I'll I'll go against Brand and say Posh is putting himself into Richter territory with the way that he's yeah. been performing this year. Um, yeah. They even put like the side-by-side numbers with him and Emberico essentially the same. And if Emberico is a guy who's had hype even prior to him starting his college career being an NTD, NTDP guy, like he's Posh, like he was save for save matching in this this weekend and so i mean not only is he perhaps goal goaltender of the year so far of the conference but nationwide as well you've got to put him in that conversation just with his numbers alone and how valuable he's been with stealing numerous wins so far for the huskies so enthusiastically i'm going posh again for my pal how about you uh yeah um i think i think that was the right choice i mean anytime you uh you don't up, give up a goal in regulation. You're you're going to get some eyes on it and only to allow, you know, the two extra man on the ice goals. Um, it, it, it It's hard not to say that uh, he deserves it. Um, so it was, I think it was definitely um, posh and go as he's will agree. So that all three of us uh, really agree that Posh is going to be the man um who gets uh who who gets the pow for the week. So and it doesn't um, seem to like he's he's got like perfect form. It do, this doesn't seem like a mirage. Like I I don't see the Denver massacre that he shouldered last year. I I just don't see that happening. Knock on wood, obviously they do play Denver later this year, but this this doesn't seem like this is a fluke. It seems like it's a different posh than we saw even last year. And there was flashes of very good posh last year. Uh, he seems locked in. He seems confident. And he seems like he's going to be this kind of goalie throughout the entire rest of the year, which if that's the case, we should savor it because he might not be here too much longer because he might have played himself out of NCAA uh, in a good way. So yeah, love to see his play and just hope that he continues uh, at this clip. No, no, hundred percent agree. Uh, and then I also have a minor correction because uh, I went back to the history and saw uh, my my tweet exchange with Schlossman, and it wasn't Kosala; it was Benick uh, when Beck and uh, when Benick made uh, second team All Conference in twenty fifteen twenty sixteen. 
Um, so he made it, his... and who was he? Who was he saying to replace him, or who who was the North Dakota player that he was saying should have made it in place of Benick? Schmaltz. It was Schmaltz. The one, of, the other of the CBS line that I didn't mention. So, yep. Um, basically saying. Um, so I said, and again, this was second team because um, Heinen, uh, Besser, and Kajula. <laughs> so you already had Besser and Kajula on the first team. Um, so basically, I want to know why, like, who would you stop? Because it was Benick and Kosala and Jake Gensel were the three that yeah. were um, on there. So I was like, okay, who do you bump? Because I had a feeling he was going to pick someone from St. Cloud State. And I'm like, oh, first off, I'm... I'm going to be marching a parade for Cali Kosala. <laughs> so Kosala and Newell are like my top ever. So, so I, I was like, okay, well, okay. So I was kind of expecting Kosala to, but then he said Bannock and I was like, he was the second leading goal scorer in third in points in conference games. So I was like, you're, you're going to bump him. Interesting choice. And he said, Schmaltz had higher points per game and missed five games three against Western two against CC. So it was the fact that he played, he did Schmaltz didn't play against Western and CC. Not that our guys did. And most of his points came against Western CC. So a little Western that year there. was terrible. They were very bad. horrible. Yeah. yeah. So, so I just, uh, just wanted to get you updated on my Schlossman, uh, filling us in on an eight, in an eight, eight, eight year old <laughs> eight Twitter years. beef. One away from a sounder. So next year I'll bring it up. I'll make sure to bring it up Let's so we that. can have the nine in there, but <laughs> not going to, not going to happen this time. So, um, yeah. So, uh, men are off. Uh, they get, they get to rest with the belly full of Turkey, uh, here for, for, for this, uh, next weekend. Uh, so let's, uh, let's just kind of go around, around the horn. Anything interesting? I already kind of brought up the, the massacre in, in Omaha, uh, the ma- the massacre of Baxter. There's something there. I don't know. I can't workshop that on the fly. It's uh, pretty good. But, um, yeah. And then we talked about, uh, Bobby Moe, um, getting into two, uh one goal tilts um with uh with North Dakota. That was the first game was one goal, wasn't it? Four to three in yeah, overtime. Four three in overtime. Yep. Um and then one nothing. So um anything else? Obviously kind of the big news uh going around uh is I, I would say the shock uh for Denver. Um not only suffering their first loss but getting swept at the hands of Arizona State. Um don't call it an a... upset. <laughs> oh, God <laughs> Yeah, here we go again with that. <laughs> I'm done. Uh, I'm not going to rub it in. Own... Not going to rub it in too much. Um, I had to. Okay. NCAA also called what? Uh, 18 C losing an upset. Like the, my whole point again is that it's an overused term. Fine. Well, see, I, I, I had to go and find that Twitter account that you were referencing. The NCAA ice hockey. And ice hockey. Is. Yep. Uh, be- because I wanted to retweet whoever it was that when they said upset and this was a perfect opportunity for it. Um, but yeah, I did see that uh, earlier today, uh, Vermont beat number 20 UMass and they did the whole si- <sighs> sirens upset sirens upset. So I'm almost on your side now. Um, yes, I, yes, I've converted you. You're coming over. You would agree kind of. that Arizona State sweeping Denver in Denver qualifies as an upset, no matter what time of year it is. It's surprising. <laughs> okay, there's there's the disconnect between me and you. I I okay. don't need to, hey, and I guess your argument is hey, Arizona State could end the year at number five, and hey, it my, couldn't look to be that much of an upset at the year's end. Den- and Denver could lose the rest, lose out the rest of the season. Theoretically, could. they could. <laughs> yeah. Okay, fine. I will concede that. Yes, this is an upset. Even one, this even upset. one win was uh, was even a, one a surprising win. result to use your your uh, verbiage. Uh, yeah, certainly didn't see that happening. No. I figured once they beat them on Friday. I mean that that game winning goal with about a minute to go. Terrible goal for Matt Davis to give up. That's the Matt oh, Davis yeah. from last year's first half. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just a weird. I, 
you never, I just don't get like teams like that with Denver. It's like their key players can look just aces one weekend and then look very pedestrian the next. Obviously it's, they've been without a blemish until this weekend, 12 and 0, but 12 and 2 now. And uh, uh, Arizona State, probably more important for them. I mean, those are two huge wins. And team at, yes, I mean, thoroughly outshot Omaha last weekend in in a home split against the Mavericks. Even with that statistical edge, I wasn't all that thrilled with Arizona State. Suppose you got to take them a little bit more seriously now. Uh, But, um, you know, big win for them. Probably the best, biggest wins of their NCAA D1 history. Uh, I'm sure that their Twitter account is saying as such. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's yeah, that, that's one of those unexpected results that can yeah, really so. can really uh, throw a wrench into the conference schedule. And again, this so we saw Western Michigan go into Duluth, take care of business with the sweep. Uh, Western's looking pretty good. Uh, they'll be tested here with Denver coming up. Uh, their next. Uh, conference series they got michigan this weekend with the home and home uh probably be watching at least some of those games uh michigan putting up a football score against uh penn state 10 to 6 win you know it's the same time st cloud is battling a 0-0 game with cc we had a 10-6 game finishing up. 10 to 6 and then michigan the night before and 6 beat to 5 them 6 to 5 you like you like so goals yeah the the Big penn Ten state going- Penn State going back to the no goalie. Yeah. Penn yeah State they have or... no goalie there and it, they can score. Uh, you can say that about the, the, the big 10 as a whole, like they're, they're putting up points. Uh, maybe not so much Wisconsin <laughs> so much, but <laughs> uh, at least the top of that league Gophers put up a bunch of goals this weekend at Notre Dame. Um, if you like goals and I, I like goals, uh, they are, it, it can be a fun league to watch. Uh, but, uh, yeah, with the NCHC, it's, you figure Denver's still in the driver's seat, even with this weekend. Western, I mean, Western with North Dakota as a team. And I am, we're going to do a pick the field uh, show. I, yeah. I'm not even sure if I would pick North Dakota at this point. They're, they're shot, the shine that they had, like at that, that seven to two win against BU, where they scored five goals in the first 10 minutes and thinking, yeah, this team looks legit. It's a lot of the same issues with them, goaltending issues, and uh, something's not not working there. And you can tell by the, uh, by the moan of the fan base, uh, wanting to, uh, to do something with the head coach there. Hashtag fire Barry. It's one of the joys of getting back on Twitter. I saw someone, someone mentioned, I wonder what Hackstall is up to. It's like, you don't know what (laughs) you, you didn't, you weren't a huge fan of him either at, at at certain times. Oh no, that person's probably too young. (laughs) <laughs> or they're really wishing Dean Blaze would come back, get some, get the program back on track. Right. So. I mean, I'm not even sure if, if he can call them like a, certainly not a shoe in, in the tournament, I would still put Denver in that, in that category, but, mm-hmm. and Western might be the, the second best team right now in the conference, or even St. Cloud's going to be in that, in that uh, conversation with the, uh, uh, the, this nine and four record or whatever it is, uh, it's looking pretty good in comparison to the, the majority of the league. So, uh, yeah, in, definitely an interesting weekend. Did not see some of these results uh, uh, happening, especially with the Arizona State ones. Yeah, I did want to hop over quickly to the CCHA as well um, as kind of two teams that were picked to be towards the top. Um, with Minnesota State and Michigan Tech and Minnesota State going out to the uh, Upper Peninsula and end up sweeping in there five to two one night and then um, three to one the next. So, uh, you know, you said um, that kind of a boost that uh, Rhett Picklick would uh, would give to that uh, Mankato team. And it's it's certainly coming through. Uh, able to do that uh, silent transfer as apparently it's called um, that he was able to get uh, get on the team and and he's been um, leading the team uh, in points and, and and right now they're they're looking really good there in the CCHA yeah and I mentioned them with they've kind of had an up and down year like look really good one night kind of lay an egg the next like the weekend before this 
beating Northern Michigan and then tying Northern Michigan, Northern Michigan being a horrendous team this year. I picked them to be the dead last team in pairwise this year. Um, I mean, they haven't lost in seven games, but there's a couple of ties in there with St. Thomas and against Northern Michigan that I mentioned a couple of one, nothing losses to the hands of Bemidji state and Miramac randomly. Uh, but big weekend for them, at least in the conference this, this weekend, I, I think that they're the best team in that conference. I'm still going to pick. I'm still sticking with Augie uh, as my pick out of that league because I like chaos. But as far as from a at-large standpoint, if there's any team in CCHA that has any at-large chances, meaning to make the tournament without needing to win the conference title, it would be Minnesota State. Uh, Augustana is the next highest team in the still too early pairwise, but they're at 22nd. Um, too early next weekend Dartmouth it'll be it, third next weekend it, it, it will be legit uh that's what woden says the so, gospel of woden the gospel right. according to woden so yeah i i'm surprised that you wanted to talk about the ccha because that's generally not where the action is so to speak but it's good to always check in it, it was it was just caught my eye because uh of uh minnesota state and michigan tech series if 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 any of those teams are playing anybody else. Yeah. I wouldn't have bat an eye on it, but um, uh, those ones kind of, yeah, definitely did catch my eye. I want to see, see uh, who is, who has Dartmouth played. Uh, Cornell, they beat, they tied Colgate and then they played Harvard in one of those oh, games. They, they beat Stonehill. Yale, maybe. A nope, couple of other yet. conferences. They've got At, BC coming up on Friday. I've mentioned yeah, this BC last coming week. up on Friday. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what that does. But yeah, we saw, but speaking of BC, they dropped a game at Northeastern on Saturday, um, splitting that series. Those Huskies were able to get a win against BC, the St. Cloud Huskies were not. <laughs> fortunately, that, Probably is not the best for St. Cloud's pairwise, although I think Northeastern struggling to start the year, but they played a tough schedule so far. And I, at the end of the year, I don't think that's going to look like a bad loss for BC. Uh, yeah. But because BC's on St. Cloud's schedule, you do like to kind of be curious about their results because it does have a tertiary impact on St. Cloud's RPI. Um, so I, I did take note of that. Um, anything else? Catch your fancy across the country. Mm, no, nope, that's pretty much all I had on my list. Um, I, I did want to check also at Brown, uh, but uh, Brown ended up winning. They had a good weekend. Uh, one nothing on a half a second left that. to go shot uh, that that was able to break the scoreless tie in regulation. Saw that. Uh, so. That's uh, that that lone us show voter is probably tap dancing in the streets of Brown University, I guess, whatever street that that university's on somewhere in Providence. Yeah, that lifted them out of the pairwise 60s. They're all the way up to 53rd. So hey, there we go. Big, uh, big jump for Brown. Yep, exactly. Uh, should we switch over to the women? Let's do it. Huskies and Gophers rekindle their rivalry, question mark, with a home-and-home home series. Friday's opener at Ritter Arena, and it takes the Gophers just 23 seconds to notch the first tally, with Ella Uber giving Amelia Carrico a rude welcome to Dinkytown. Huskies would tie it up with five minutes left in the first period on the power play, as Abby Probersberger with a beautiful tip of a Taylor Larson shot from the point. But the Gophers strike back quickly just over a minute later with Ava Lindsay putting the Gophers back on top 2-1. Husky killer and certified pest Abby Murphy makes it 3-1 early in the second period. But Huskies power play effective again as Allie Qualley gets her first goal as a Husky, tapping in a great feed by Bria Parent to make it 3-2. It would stay that way until the third period when the Gophers again score in the first minute of the period. Abby Murphy with her second goal of the game. Murphy would complete the hat trick with an empty netter at 18:42 of the third, and the Gophers take the opener 5 to 2. Gophers lead in shots on goal 34 to 27, and goalie Hannah Clark wins her sixth straight start to backstop Minnesota to victory. On to St. Cloud for Game Two on Saturday, where the Huskies were looking to beat the Gophers on home ice for the first time since Avatar was in its initial theatrical run. 
Sani Ahola squares off against Clark in the two match wits for the first period and a half until Abby Promersberger breaks through halfway into the second period with a nice turnover and breakaway goal to put the Huskies up 1-0. Just under two minutes into the third period, the Huskies would take a 2-0 lead with Bria Parent finishing off a two-on-one opportunity to score her fifth goal of the season. A minute later, Avery Farrell is the beneficiary of some puck luck when her shot deflects off a gopher defender and all of a sudden it's 3-0 lead for the Huskies. Natalie Milankovo cut into the deficit for the Gophers with her seventh of the year at 624 of the third period, but Ahola and company would stave off any further comeback attempt, and the Huskies notched their biggest win of the season, 3-1 over Minnesota. Gophers with 39 shots, including 23 in the first period alone, but the Huskies outshoot the Gophers in the second and the third, and Sandy Ahola gets her first win since October 11th, stopping 38 shots in the Huskies' victory. Well, uh, if you told me that uh, we were going to split against the Gophers um, uh, coming in, I would have uh, gladly taken it. And really, overall, even as a whole, even, I mean, you can look at 5-2 to two and kind of shake your head for Friday, but I was really happy with how this Huskies team played. Um, really, really top to bottom all weekend. Um, yeah, uh, the, a couple of spots maybe were a little bit rough, but I, I thought... Um, especially especially saturday second and third period um it just it was uh it, it, it was so good to to see the huskies kind of get back at it and, and uh be aggressive and really irritate um uh the, the gophers and uh come out on top here on that uh saturday game what were your uh, thoughts on the weekend I agree. Even the five to two game, the loss on Friday, I thought was an improvement. It might be just a matter of perception as far as like, it felt like they were playing a better game than they did against Mankato. But that might just be because when they're playing Mankato, I'm sort of expecting them to win that game. Whereas you're playing at Ritter, the expectations aren't the same. So maybe the fact that they were able to, to stay in that game for most of it, um, was more impressive than it actually was. I'm not sure, but it felt like their offensive pressure uh, was there to an extent that it hasn't been uh, in the last couple of weeks. And yeah, some, some timely offense, uh, which is not Mm -hmm. something that we've been able to say. Yeah. We, we haven't said that a lot about the uh, Husky squad. Yeah. And good on the power play. I mean, two power play goals on, on Friday, your only offense, uh, Promersberger had a good weekend all weekend, I thought. And yep. good to see Allie Qualley get on the score sheet. First goal of the year for her. Uh, she's had opportunity. I mean, they put her on Gentry's line for a couple of games. Um, with the lack of offense that she's produced, that was kind of a surprising move at the time. So it's nice to see her being able to chip in. That was mostly a Bria Parent special uh, with a nice feed there from from the corner uh quality park yep. out front and a nice misdirect uh just left alone by the gophers yeah. defense yeah and i mean you know, murphy I mean, we, we've seen enough of her to know her bit <laughs> uh getting the hat trick yeah which was not uh not good to see and they were yeah that first period st cloud out, out shoots them on friday a lot of that was based on penalty trouble that the gophers were getting into murphy included in some of that which is not surprising, uh, but uh, it was a game where, yeah, once Minnesota was able to, to re- respond quickly after Primersberger's power play goal, um, it's kind of like it's you feel like you get you play with this team tied. The longer you play with them tied, the better the chances are, that you are going to have to pull an upset. But the fact that the Gophers were there with those quick first period goal and third period mm-hmm. goal in the first minute of those periods, and then just the quick response they had to the Promisberger goal. Gophers were in control of the game um, for almost all of it in the third period after they get the the fourth goal from the second of the game from Murphy to make it four to two. You felt like that was, that was enough of a cushion that they weren't going to give that. They weren't going to give up four goals to the Huskies at that point. Um, yeah. So frustrating, but I I felt like there was improvements from what I saw and, feel like, yeah, you had a bad first period on Saturday uh, with the Gophers kind of peppering Ahola. Great kind of comeback for her. Like, we haven't yeah. had much to say about her. It's been more mainly the Carico show. 
uh, over the last month or so. But uh, Ahola played like a goalie that wanted to prove herself again. Like this is this is why I've I've nailed down this position for you know for four years, and she played very well. And she, because you're able to weather the storm after the first period. The plays that they're able to make in the second, so Promisberger, I mean, makes that entire play happen. Turnover yep. in the neutral zone. I thought that she just didn't have enough speed there to to complete the breakaway. Like I was, I was thinking that the Gopher defense was going to catch up to her, kind of on her bumper there, but she was able to get the shot off and get it past Clark, who's been a hot goalie for the Gophers, and great to see that. Um, and similar to that two on one play with with Parent. Uh, finishing it off there in the third period, the, the feral goal. She's she's got a knack for dirty goals. Yeah, uh, she's just love it. The track, the it. trashiest score on the team for the for the <laughs> Gophers, but they they count all the same. Um, but it's nice to so it's nice to see. And two. then you could argue that we should have got one even shortly after that too. Yeah, um, the, the quick whistle. The quick whistle happened, yeah. and that was a little bit frustrating uh, that it should have been four rip um, at that point, which uh, I was not seeing three rip ha- uh, in, in, on the bingo no. card, much less four, nothing. Were you, by the way, the, for the promise burger goal, were, was that you in the corner there? Is that, that was me in the corner? Cause I figured yep. that's kind that's... of been your spot this year. Yep. And so that must've been, that must've been kind of cool with the celebration kind of happening right in front of you. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, that was really cool. I was there kind of banging on the glass there. I was trying to get my kids up and pumped that I was like, yeah, let's come on. Come on. Like uh, they weren't really having it. I think they were just <laughs> like, oh, my gosh, this horn is really loud. Um, and that's the thing. It's like when you're at the women's game, it's like there's not like a volume setting on the goal horn, I think. Um, so when there's you know not a lot of people there it is louder because it just echoes more so you know we have earmuffs for the kids um but i was trying to like get them like excited i was like hey this is this is a big deal we scored and so now i'm just a 40 year old man banging up the glass and (laughs) you know trying to uh trying to show some excitement there but yeah that i mean coming at me and i saw that she had it and i was like um you know i saw the defense kind of closing in and collapsing and but when um uh yeah when uh the uh go for goalie went down i'm blanking on your name you just said it clark hannah clark Clark, thank you hannah clark um well you know once she went down i was like oh there it is and went ahead slipped it uh slipped it in and it was um you know it was a big weekend a big weekend for the transfers i mean in general i mean all all goals were um you know from from the transfers so that was um yeah. So yeah, that that was good to see the other action in the third happened on the other side. So I, I didn't get a great look of it, but I did obviously see the, the missed, uh, the missed call. Um, but I did have a couple of proud moments. Um, one of it was um, for uh parent school. Um, as, as I was sitting down there, you know, I'm, you know, so where I'm at, I'm sitting behind the, the, uh, on that end, it's the St. Cloud state goalie um for the third period and there's the door there um that it's like the cic door that it's like a door that kind of goes easy access down to the um locker room area so um you know you'll have the scratches kind of come in and out of that door and whatnot so jojo kind of comes in and walks out of that door kind of walks by me and like as she's walking like out of my frame or no, it was right before she was like, she was like walking in and I say, Oh, there it is. And then two seconds later we scored and it was just one of those things. And so it's like her, me saying there it is like caused her to look and then we scored. And then, you know, obviously we were both, you know, cheering and happy. So it was like, it's kind of that sixth sense that I have when I sense a goal coming. And I did the same. If you watch the replay also of the Sunderland goal, if you see me in the corner, I stand up before Sunderland actually puts that in uh, against Mankato for the game winner. So it's, um, it's like the sixth sense is like, okay, here it is. And uh, just being able to call a goal um, and then have other people hear it. And then obviously a hockey player here at like Jojo of her repertoire. It's just, 
I don't know. It made me feel good. It, it, it was a nice, uh, nice little moment there. And then jo- um, JoJo's turning to you, be like, "Wow, what? Like you, you got the you, probably you sensed care it." Less. And then you were doing <laughs> chest bumps, and you were getting all, all yeah, in it. Oh yeah, exactly. I was like, "Yep, just high fiving." You know. Yeah, not a case. She was really nice as my kids were kind of dancing around um, in that area. And were you like really uh, annoying her <laughs> did you do like the chris farley show like hey jojo that was that was really good like, so your podcast your car got broken I, into, I'm huh? really big fan <laughs> i really like your show i i, I did you did see not... i i need again needing to catch up i saw that larson was was on uh, their last show yes so i gotta watch that uh, brett larson men's coach um yep. double yep. change how yep. about the other then, larson though you got an and injury, then soriel is going to be coming up here this week oh nice um, I, so, uh, so so that'll be in yeah so i said that i would be surprised if reagan volger is out because she was kind of limping around and sure enough she plays not only did she play on saturday i thought she was excellent on saturday i thought she had a heck of a, really all of the defense i thought had a heck of a game um, obviously you had to weather that first, uh, period for, for Saturday's game. But after that, I thought they really shut things down and the, their breakout passes were really crisp. And I thought, you know, they, the men's team needs to learn that it's okay to, you know, carry the puck a, a little bit in the, in your own zone to, you know, to connect a pass, to try to break it out of your own end and not just try to flip it out on, you know, hot potato it. I thought, you know, the women were a lot more calm when it comes to their breakouts and and um, really alleviating the pressure that the Gophers, when they did have it in the in that second and third period. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so Reagan Bolger was out there, which I thought that she wouldn't play with the way she was limping around the National Hockey Center. But, yeah, I see uh, Taylor Larson on crutches. Um, I think so, like that was an injury in the Friday game. That had to have been because she. I didn't see it. I, I might have missed I it. That, like either. by the third period, that's kind of when the men's game started. So I was kind of watching both, and I'm. I don't mm-hmm. think I would have seen if there was an injury timeout. I feel like I would have picked up on that. It's been pretty good. Mm-hmm. I mean, she had that assist on the Primersberger power play goal. She shot the puck that Primersberger had the nice tip. Uh, she's been good this year. Uh, steady. It's not yeah. like she's a you know offensively minded defenseman, but rock solid. I think in uh, on the back end. So yeah, you're going to deal with injuries. It it, it sucks, mm. uh, but if we're going to have Bulger come back and play as well as she did, then uh, next woman up, I guess. But uh, yeah. Wolf, I think too. I, so Murphy takes three penalties in the weekend. <laughs> I think it was Wolf that was kind of assigned to to be the yeah. the Himmlerova role this year. I think it worked. I mean, the 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 uh, the hat trick aside, um, Saturday she was contained. And she was frustrated noticeably because, you know, taking two penalties and not being able to break through offensively I think was a big, so here's, key. so, so here's my, here's my moment. And again, me being a 39 year old overweight, balding man, just chirping, <laughs> you know, 22 year old college uh, women that are infinitely better at the game than I am. Um, <laughs> But okay, so Friday's game happens. Ellie Soriel gets a penalty called at the end of the first period where she's coasting. Like the horn sounds, she's coasting. Abby Murphy pretends like she got shot from the school puck depository here. Okay, like it's absolutely ridiculous how quickly she goes down, slams her head back, ends up getting the penalty call. Just complete dive. You're not calling her a flopper. On yes. Show. Are you? Yes. No. I a hundred percent. Here's no. the thing. She is a hundred percent. The Ted DiBiase of the WCHA. <laughs> she is the ultimate heel. She is a technically sound wrestler, or in this case, a heck of a, a hockey player, heck of a goal scorer. So good. You can't ignore her, but she will cheat and she will steal. And like, if a little kid is, you know, bouncing, a, you, you, you'll, you'll try to bet him a hundred dollars. He won't bounce a basketball 10 times. Abby Murphy would swat it away at number eight and not think anything of it. 
Like that's ju- ju- just how she is. Also has the the titles to prove it too. Just like Ted DiBiase never never won the uh, heavyweight title. So, so and that's what uh, Abby Murphy is. And uh, so what happens is that um she gets into it um and and she's kind of, you know, she's chirping like she she's yelling at something. She has a shot uh, a hole of saves it who again, a hole played absolutely wonderful. Um, but, um, she kind of skates by me down in the corner and I put my hands up like dive. So I'm chirping her like she's a big diver. And I am pretty sure she looked at me and just me calling her a diver. Um, and then as she's skating, she's skating back. And then I've got the scratches up in the corner for the, the Minnesota team. And they're, just, they're all like two seconds later, they go, let's get a Murph. <laughs> So they're cheering to get Murphy going. That's good. So a <laughs> couple minutes later, she takes the penalty. And I said, way to get a Murph. <laughs> and I yell that out. <laughs> and and that's that's also, you know, it, to, you buy the ticket, you ride the ride with Abby Murphy. And it's it's always going to be a roller coaster because here's the thing. Long and short of it is a three to one game. And she is far and away your best goal scorer, maybe one of the best pure goal scorers in college hockey. And she just can't contain herself and takes a stupid penalty. And, and again, she's it, been ma- she's been mainly well behaved this year. Like this is not right la- like last year where she's setting yeah. the league record for penalty minutes. So this is like the this is the tame version of Abby Murphy. <laughs> this is the toned down Abby Murphy. And it's just like it, yeah yeah it, it's 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 your like this your team needs you here and this is what you end up doing and it's just got to be incredibly frustrating for brad foss and i love it <laughs> and it's great and then not only that but the power play that the huskies do after that was one of the most magnificent power play just ultimate kill time back and forth no one's gonna take a shot Minnesota, by the way, wasn't even pressuring, which I didn't understand that at all. Like, like you're down by two. And even though you're shorthanded, you got to do something to, to try to get the puck and St. Cloud just end up content, just passing it around. Absolutely doing nothing. Um, So that was wonderful to see. Um, And then I also wanted to point out that, uh, a couple minutes earlier, I think it was before the Abby Murphy penalty, but they, um, I, I couldn't see cause it was on the other end of the ice. Um, but the Huskies just pinned the puck up against the board. And I swear they let that play go for like a minute 15 of just nothing happening and just pinned up against the board. And I'm just there cheering. I'm just hollering. No, everybody else is dead quiet. My wife is like, it's really loud when nobody else is in here and you're just yelling. And I'm just cheering at this ultimate time wasting effort of it. Just, and the rest just let it go for, I swear it was over a minute that it was, it was just of it being pinned up against the boards and nothing happening. Um, whereas the Minnesota contingent that was in the crowd, which there were a lot of them, uh, were pretty unhappy that the, the, uh, play wasn't called dead, but I had, a, anyway, alcohol, you know, no alcohol aside. I had a lot of fun at the women's game and it's, it's even better that, uh, the Huskies ended up winning, uh, for the first time in, you know, a, a very long time, uh, against the Gophers and, uh, at home. To, 2010, at they, home. they won that hall of fame game two years ago yep. against them, but uh, not no wins at the herb since 2010. So yeah, that was great to see. And yeah, if you're, you know, 479 show up on Saturday, like if you're the loudest voice among that 479, not only is that more effective, but they will actually hear you. So <laughs> I, I like that idea of being that guy for yeah. these in, yeah, at the women's games at the herb. I, I like that idea. Yep, exactly. They and they did definitely hear me. So it seems um, like you're going. Are you just so, going on Saturdays? Are you going yeah, on Fridays that, as well? No, that the Saturdays are just the best for the family. But it um, seems like you plan on attending as many as you can on Saturdays. Yeah, mm-hmm. well, great. 
it's um like it's just like i said like with the the family the time slot the afternoon games um are the best saturday or friday's game with it being you know i taking off work and then getting the kids from daycare or you know school sometimes or at night you know sometimes if it's a six o'clock game that can still get a little bit too late for the twins um since they, they i want to get them in bed by you know seven fifteen, seven thirty. so but the the three o'clock afternoon games are saturday are absolutely perfect for me so yeah we've been um you know we went to the ohio state game uh that was a victory in a shootout we went to the mankato game that was a victory in overtime and then now this one was a, a victory here for uh for the huskies in in regulation Magic char- so, lucky charm we only yeah, got th- mate. only three more saturday home games Can you believe that mm-hmm. uh road heavy second half but you got uh duluth coming in two it looks like that's a 1 p.m start on december 7th 1 p.m on saturday january 18th against bemidji and then a 3 p.m against the golfers uh february 15th so okay. a couple more opportunities for you to go but i i like that you're making the most of it and you're seeing good results and seeing yeah. exciting games. Uh, that's seeing that's good results, good and and it's been it's been um, really 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 fun, really good, and again, really good hockey. Um, and you really uh, appreciate how fast it is, um, especially when you're down at ice level. I'm normally not a big fan of being ice level in hockey. Um, I do feel if you are ice level you know, being down on the end is the best versus, you know, kind of down on, on the, on the sides. I feel like you only get a real glimmer of, of the action and, and really good. I, I'd rather at least get a sheet of the ice. That's, that's really good. But it was, um, yeah, overall, uh, the effort from the Huskies, especially that Saturday game can't, um, speak enough to it and really in, in, enjoyed um you know how they played i'm a little bit uh bummed out that uh Adelsky's press conference hasn't been uploaded yet for saturday's game but i'm interested to hear his take on on the uh, uh on the game but i bet the locker room was uh pretty jacked up after afterwards and it was uh you know also just a big three points um uh for 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 the huskies and and, um, you know, I don't want to get my, uh, too ahead of myself, but uh, only taking two points out of Mankato, that's not looking nearly as bad um, a- after this uh, last weekend that the Mankato had as well. So, yeah, we'll, but we'll get to that. But how about we'll get um, to that. how about a pow? Powell is Promisberger, and um, I, I think her showing up on, on both nights is um, kind of what put it up there for me. Um and Ahola was going to be like my one B. Um, if we could split it, I would, but I'm not going to split it. I'm going to go with Promise Burger um, because this team has had trouble scoring goals, and her being on the score sheet both nights um, was uh, was was great to see. So uh, I've given it to Promise Burger overall. Um, Ahola, um, I, I thought she was obviously incredibly steady in, in that. Just absolutely solid came up with big saves defense had to clear it out when they needed to a um, couple of moments were a little bit uh, uh, stand on the neck back you know stand your hair on your neck uh, stands up back worthy but overall it was um, it was it was a wonderful weekend on her and I would imagine um, you know she's going to get the start against uh, Minnesota Duluth when that comes up yeah, well, I guess we'll see. I'm curious as far as it looked like it was Carrico's job there for a couple of weeks. I think, you know, Ahola has been dealing some injuries this year herself. I, I wonder if we're going to stick with the Carrico Friday, Ahola Saturday, flip flop those, give maybe Ahola the whole weekend to make up for some time lost. Interesting to see how that shakes out. I, I am tempted to give the pow to Ahola, even though she just played the one game that first period on saturday 23 to 8 shot mm-hmm. advantage uh i feel like if the gophers get that first goal it's a whole different game unfolds a lot differently also should mention some penalty trouble that st cloud got into on saturday the five minute major that they had to kill off Part of that was that they had to review. <laughs> oh yeah, part of that was canceled out by a Murphy penalty, one of her one of her penalties. But uh, 
the Murphy you know, special. Part of that first period was uh, <laughs> everybody's got a price. <laughs> that first period, part of it on Saturday was complicated by a couple of penalties that uh, St. Cloud took that overlapped a little bit, sh- briefly a five on three. And uh, again, you, you get out of that period scoreless, uh, not behind a uh, big difference in how this game unfolded. So I'm almost tempted to give it to her. Primersberger probably was my, my number one pick, but I'll go. I mean, you got parent and Farrell who both had good weekends. I'll go parent. Cause I don't think I've given it to her yet. I feel like Farrell has got a pow. Again, I, I always say that I should keep a spreadsheet of these because we can go at the end of the year to see who, who wins the pow of the year. Uh, award, the pow so award. We, can, we don't have yet, but maybe I'll, do we can that, give them a trophy and a $5 gift certificate to Chipotle. Could do that. Uh, <laughs> Bonanza maybe. Uh, uh, but the, not you know, anymore. Banana, banana that, clothes. That's what would play. make it the best to give them a bonanza uh, gift certificate because uh, they don't exist in St. Cloud anymore. But uh, parent, I thought Too was soon. By the way, I had a I had an old coworker. God, did she love bonanza? Like I think you brought up she... that coworker before because we've <laughs> yeah. had this discussion before, and I probably mentioned yeah, that I had she... a job that I got like an employee of the month once. That my 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 prize was a bonanza gift certificate. So, I mean, R.I.P. Bonanza is what I yeah, can say. Right. Exactly. But uh, Parent, you know, has that great feed on Friday, which which uh, uh, Quali tapped in for the for the uh, second goal for St. Cloud in that game and gets that key second goal here. Farrell with a good feed. Uh, but uh, Parent's been really good this year. I mean, a good a good pickup in the portal. Um, she's been pretty good in the face-off dot all year she wasn't the best this weekend but um she brings a a, a full game uh with her center play uh and and as far as we're talking about this is another quiet weekend for gentry uh but uh if we can have players like parents step up uh it makes this team that much more formidable and if we're talking about uh how this team stacks up nationwide I argue because women start a little bit earlier than the men. It is legit to look fairwise at this point in the year. And St. Cloud with this weekend with that win over the according golfers, to the gospel of Woden. That's right. Uh, using his metric, uh, this would count as legitimate pairwise. St. Cloud up to eight uh, in pairwise, and mm. that's a good spot to be. That would put you in the tournament if it ended today. Obviously, there's a long way to go there, but this it illustrates uh, the opportunities that you get in this conference uh, when you're playing teams like Wisconsin, the Gophers, Ohio State, Duluth. When you're playing 16 games, almost half of your schedule against teams of that quality, it ramps up the difficulty for sure. Yes, but you pick up wins and pick up points against these teams. Uh, that can make a, a play uh, upwards in the pairwise. Uh, makes that task that much easier to gain in the pairwise, much more so than teams like the Hockeys that we've talked about with BU and BC Northeastern kind of clumped there in pairwise territory right now. Their schedules aren't as, aren't as hot, which means that you drop a game against a lower team, it, it sinks you like a stone. And you don't have as many opportunities to make up ground because you're not playing the strength schedule that WCHA offers. So uh, this team is in good shape. If you would have told me at the beginning of the year that at this point in the season, uh, at Thanksgiving, that you're eighth in pairwise, that's a good spot to be. Now, again, it's not certain by any means. The second half is going to be a gauntlet maybe not so much difficulty wise as it was last year, but still with the road heaviness of it uh, does not give me the most confidence that this is going to be a sure thing by any means, but uh, winning a a big game like this gets you that big benefit. Hopefully they can keep that going uh, this next weekend against union. Um, Before we jump over to union, um, I just kind of want to jump on and say, uh, my opinion not only hasn't really changed about the Gophers, it's maybe gone down a little bit. Um, as in, yeah, I think they're firmly fourth 
Um, and granted, we haven't played Minnesota Duluth yet, so it's so maybe that's you know maybe I'm putting them on a little bit of a pedestal because we haven't seen them, but overall, I wasn't like blown away with them like we like I was with Wisconsin, um, and I think I just don't think Minnesota has the depth. Um, oh, overall, and it's, it'll be interesting to see kind of where things that they, you know, end up with them. I do expect them obviously to be in the tournament, but overall you get us in a one game series. I like our chances against Duluth so far, obviously, or I'm sorry. Uh, I like our chances against uh, the Gophers way more than I like it against like Wisconsin or Ohio state. No, oh, I I would agree with that. I the Gophers swept Duluth last weekend in Duluth. Ergo, I would give them the edge over Duluth, meaning I think they're going to be third place um, rather than fourth. But I wouldn't be surprised uh, if that's flip flopped. Um, I'm interested to see what Mankato can continue to do. They might be more of a danger to the Huskies than the Huskies would be to uh, Duluth true. or the Gophers. I guess we can recap the weekend a little bit with uh, Mankato getting an overtime loss. So some RPI. Do you want to do you want to recap the the weekend, or do you want to go into Union quick? Let's recap the weekend first, and then we can preview okay. Union. But yeah, Mankato with four points over Ohio State, so an overtime loss. Which they had to tie that within the last ten seconds, I believe, of that game. Empty uh, netter. Yep. Get an extra attacker goal. or extra attacker. Sorry, yep. Yeah. And then uh, winning in regulation four to one on Saturday, uh, and I believe they had a chance in overtime too. That just I trickled mean, just like a overtime. couple inches wide. I watched so, the like I watched the majority of that second half of the game. Their game on it was kind of my secondary game uh, on Saturday afternoon. I didn't look like a fluke to me. I mean, Ohio State had a shot advantage, but. Uh, Mankato was was playing pretty well. Yeah, I like their goalie, that Hanson that they have. And like we mentioned last week, they, they've got some players that can score. So I, I think they're legit. I'm not saying that they're going to be a tournament team, but they might be, I mean, especially with their four-point weekend against the Huskies, they've still got two games in hand versus everybody else in the conference, four games in hand against Ohio State. Uh, but so they got some games in hand, like, like they're getting swept against St. Thomas looks terrible for them. Like that, uh, that's killing them right now. Mm-hmm. If that's even a split at this point, they could be ahead of the Huskies. So uh, that was definitely an interesting uh, result. No other real surprises in the conference with uh, Duluth and uh, Wisconsin handling Bemidji and St. Thomas respectively uh, mentioning that St. Thomas uh, getting swept or uh, Mankato getting swept at the hands of St. Thomas, not looking so good really might not look so good. Cause St. Thomas had a surprise with, uh, with Joel Johnson tendering his resignation sounds like, so they get swept at Bemidji last weekend. And after the Friday game, I was, so we we're talking about a after the Friday game against Mankato would have been the same night when St. Thomas was playing Bemidji and Adolski clearly had, uh, he was not very pleased with the uh, Huskies effort on Friday. We did see a good response on Saturday, but I'm, I'm assuming there was, you know, some heatedness in that locker room after the game on Friday. And I think the message got across to the players. They've played much better in the three games since then probably Johnson again, nothing's been made official or leaked out as far as what the conduct was, but the fact that he resigned fairly quickly, he was, he was not the coach behind the bench for the Saturday game and then resigned on Tuesday. So I'm assuming he crossed a line. I, again, until it comes out like the Rick Bennett situation from Union a couple years ago, seemed like he might've been railroaded there. Uh, but from Johnson's standpoint, that's a surprise. I mean, he was a coach for St. Thomas's entire run at the D1 level. 
Uh, he was the women's Olympic team coach 2022. So he had a pretty good profile, longtime assistant under Frost there. The Gophers kind of got the job at St. Thomas. Now his record looks bad from St. Thomas, but he got a factor in. He's starting that program at the D1 level from scratch. Uh, still with a you know disadvantage when it comes to facilities and all that. You see kind of the same thing going on with the men's side. Once they get their facility in place in a couple of years, we both kind of expect St. Thomas to be a legit contender. And you figured that Johnson was part of that, that long-term plan. But uh, obviously that has, uh, has ended. And so we don't see mid-season coaching changes happen very often. And typically if it does happen, it's because of a, a scandal of some sort um, or some sort of disciplinary, you know, like you crossed a line kind of thing. You just don't, again, don't see it and the speed that it happened. Something happened in that locker room uh, yeah. that led to this uh, outcome. Um, so going forward, you got to kind of think St. Thomas, I mean, the St. Cloud shootout loss to them doesn't look so good. Like you, you almost think that this could really turn into a bad season for St. Thomas. It's not like they were on the way to a competitive season, but this might mean St. Thomas might not win too many games the rest of the way. Like I wouldn't be surprised if that's how it turns out, uh, especially if they're getting swept to the hands of, of the Midgey, those kind of teams which led to his ouster. Uh, so surprised. I don't know if you have any comment on that, but it might, it might mean St. Thomas is even a lesser team than they already had been. And so going forward, they're a team that you got to feel any team that plays them has got to be licking their chops. So I, I, yeah. I don't know if you have anything to add. Uh, the only thing I had to add was um, I didn't really care for just Myers, this comment. Um, I didn't see that. I know you're usually a fan of his comments. So let you me know. Yeah, because huge <laughs> Jess Myers Stan over here. Um, but he uh, he threw out there among the comments I have heard from sources close to the Tommies is this is a heartbreaking loss for the game as Johnson was viewed as one of uh, one who was doing things the right way, recruiting and developing freshmen to build a program. And like. This is, I guess, my problem with Jess Myers and maybe, a, you know, a lot and maybe it's not fair to just say him. Uh, but I will just say him, uh, you're a journalist. Okay. Like you, just to throw out unnamed sources, which he does all the time, which I don't know if he's telling the truth or if he's just full of it, but at the same time, it's just like, just to throw out, Oh yeah, well I'm hearing blah, 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 not putting anyone's name by it. And tell to not get all the facts. Like, okay, what are the facts? What happened? You're a journalist, figure it out what word in Bernstein, like, like, are you going to actually like get to the bottom of what happened? And then we can judge whether or not this is actually a heartbreaking loss for the game, or if this is something really terrible that did happen. Um, but just to throw out that your subjective point of view that, Oh, this is just terrible. And I've got other people. I promise I've got other people that say this is bad too. Like, this is just a bummer for the game. Because it was the right way, not not the wrong way to do it, which, again, I don't even know what that is. But it was just I, I didn't care for that aspect of it. And until we know more, if we will ever know more, because, again, just Myers, go ahead and do something. <laughs> call some people, call some sources to figure out what the what the scandal is here. Um, but there's there's something more to the story that's not being reported. And I don't think people who are doing things the right way get ousted mid series. <laughs> like this is like like the optics of it aren't looking good. And like if you were to actually do some type of reporting so I can actually, you know, we can make that judgment on what's not. But just to throw the subjective point of view out there, I don't know. It It, it really irks me. Maybe that's just me, though. I get that. I mean, the the closest uh, parallel to this would be the Rick Bennett situation from Union a couple of years ago, where it came out. I I don't know if the entire story came out, but it seemed like there was it was one player who made a lodged complaint to the university, and then that's what got him fired. To the extent where more players came out, the current players came out in support of Bennett 
then were critical of him. And they were more critical of the university making a rash decision in their minds. With like Myers and college hockey journalists in, in general, it's always been way too coach sucky uppy too. Um, you never know when you really need that Cornell coach to give you a good good lead from the gospel of Woden. <laughs> and I get it. I mean, they're the coaches are far more interesting humans than the players based on all kinds of player interactions that we've been subjected to uh, or lack thereof. Uh, and so if you're getting a want to quote, you're going to go to the coach and those are the guys that are there for, you know, more than four years. You got players there for four years. You've got a coach in place for usually 10 years plus. So long-term relationships, you got guys like the final five rubbing elbows with everybody. It's a little kind of boys club that I, uh, I've always kind of felt uh, put off by that sort of access journalism. It's not just college hockey, but it feels like it's it's more endemic in the college hockey community than it is in other sports. So that doesn't surprise me that that's the kind of quoting that he's getting. I would love to see some actual reporting. I mean, St. Thomas was very much close to the chest on this one close to the mm-hmm. best. I don't know. I think it's close to the best. We're not, we're oh, yeah. not, ex- uh, we're not exp- expanding on any sort of details and who knows if that will come out. If it does, it might need to be some sort of, if no there's any, ask. if there's any defense uh, by any of the players that say that they disagreed with the, with the move, I'd like to know what, what went on, but uh, we might not be privy to that information, but it's, you know, like I said, only one coach coaches the Olympic team. And this was the guy that coached the last Olympic team. So it's not like this was some schmuck, nobody. Um, he was a uh, coach that was respected in, in coaches circles and had been getting some high profile gigs as a result. So it's uh, when I saw the news, it was a couple of days late and I'm like, Oh wow. I did not, did not uh, see that coming. And like I said, if that, has a ripple effect in terms of how St. Thomas plays out this season and then like who they hire. I mean, they had an interim coach, one of their assistants is taking the job for the rest of this season, but you got to figure they're going to want to put a, a, a coach in place there for their transition to their new building. Um, this is like we mentioned, I still think it's a, it's a desirable job to have because yeah, I think it's a program so. on the rise and a good spot for recruiting. Um, I think there was going to be a lot of interest in that job. So uh, keep uh, keep an eye on that situation because uh, either if we get some more details coming out about the Johnson uh, resignation or just the job in general, seeing if, uh, you know, who's going to put their hat in the ring for that job. Uh, that'll be an interesting development to keep, to keep, uh, keep track of. Um, I, also wanted to quickly just go back um, as we were talking about Ohio state, um, Amanda Thiel uh, was the goalie um, that uh, ended up getting the loss for Ohio state against Mankato um, eight, eight and three. Uh, there is her record 12 games, uh, Haley McLeod, uh, which is the uh, junior, the transfer from Minnesota Duluth um, has only gotten in six games. Um, I wonder what uh, is going to ha- happen there, but um, basically, Amanda, you know, what we're looking at eight eighty three save percentage. Um, so that's uh, you know, four goals on twelve shots. That'll do it. <laughs> um, I guess I didn't double check to the see the thing. She like she doesn't all of them. She doesn't see a ton of shots, so if she gives up goals, it's going to make her save percentage go. I, I think she's a better goalie than those numbers. I mean, they won the national three title. goals against she won the national uh, last title one was empty netter 2022. So, I mean, she's a goalie. That's won a title for him, won a natty. Uh, and this is her fifth and final year. Uh, yeah, the numbers don't look great. Uh, you, you kind of wonder if that was like, I think we even mentioned it, like more thinking that because Mankato looked pretty good against the Huskies, seeing how they're going to match up against Ohio state. And then in retrospect, it's kind of like, uh, with Denver sweeping North Dakota, kind of maybe prime in retrospect, kind of prime for a letdown. Maybe similar situation with Ohio State beating previously unbeaten Wisconsin. 
could have been set up for uh, for a disappointment this past weekend and Mavericks were able to take advantage. Uh, it's good. I mean, the more parity that we get, the better in this league. So yeah. it's nice that a team like Mankato can can have a four point weekend against Ohio State it makes it more interesting. It's, it's almost like there are six teams now that you got to think of in this conference rather than rather than just five. Um, uh, this weekend, uh, the women heading out to Schnecki, the Union Garnet Chargers, uh, six and nine so far, um, on the season three and three in the ECAC. Um, and, uh, a couple of interesting results. Um, they had kind of a, a, a lull there in October, um, lost one to RIT, two to Penn state, two to New Hampshire, um, end up, uh, beating Cornell three to two Colgate losing a tight one. Um, Clarkson losing one in OT. So, um, you know, it's kind of an interesting team, uh, whereas, uh, it's going to be kind of an ebb and flow. Um, uh, but the one that you're going to have to watch out for, um, leading the team in points, 14 points, 15 games, 10 goals already, already on the season is uh Carrie Ann Engelbert freshman, um from ontario who's been uh, really lighting it up had a hat trick against harvard earlier this year so that's uh gonna be uh, you know kind of the who you gotta watch for um the garnet chargers um uh, for for union and i mean you can't say it without like i know it's just it's uh really, but really it's, stupid name. Yeah, but it's uh it's one of those um out of conference series um that you know uh, in the ECAC and it, it, it's it's one that's going to go a long way if you take care of business and end up sweeping. Yeah, this is a uh, back end of the reciprocal series that they had with Union. So they started the year St. Cloud had a home series against Union last September. That was their summer series last year to start the year, <laughs> uh, and St. Cloud. Took them to the woodshed, six to one, four to nothing. Uh, penalty filled affairs. Uh, four penalties taken by Union in the Saturday game. Seven penalties they took in the Sunday game. Uh, six penalties that St. Cloud took that Sunday game too. So chippy, chippy affair. Uh, but uh, St. Cloud seemingly handled them with ease. And it's, you know, ten goal a weekend for St. Cloud that doesn't happen too often with this uh with this huskies team so faced uh uh looked very well very good against them when they faced them last year so when this year's schedule came out and you see the return trip uh, uh over thanksgiving weekend this year kind of assuming that this is going to be a two win don't really need to even break a sweat kind of series the union seems definitely improved um from from last year uh, you mentioned uh, some results that you know, early in the season in non-conference that don't look very impressive. Uh, but since conference play has started for them, um, they've been pretty competitive, uh, you know, with wins against Cornell was the first ever win that they had at Cornell. Uh, they also beat uh, Harvard and Dartmouth, two bottom feeders in the ECAC, but you know, close, close games at Colgate went to overtime at Clarkson. They've been on the road for the last six games uh, or five games. They've got a midweek game against their big rival RPI. Yeah, this, this road week. on the East coast is different and road against RPI. That's like a 10 minute drive from, from where you is right there in the capital region of New York. So yeah, it's uh, the, the travel is, is not as, not as heavy uh, as, as it is out East, but uh, uh but so St. Cloud getting their getting their uh, frequent flyer mile, miles in this uh, this series, but um, as you mentioned, they've got some players that you got to keep an eye on. Uh, I like to think that this is going to be a two win weekend for the Huskies, but I don't think that these are going to be six to one and four to nothing games. Um, mm-hmm. Mainly, a this isn't an offense that necessarily can put up ten goals with ease, uh, but also uh, unions improved from last year. Um, so I'd like to see how they, how they stack up. Um, but I'd like to think I almost like, I like a road trip around the holidays. It's good bonding experience for the team. So, uh, so I, I like their chances. They'll be seeing a familiar goalie by most likely it's Sophie Matsukas 
uh, which was their goalie last year, last couple of years, been their main starter. So St. Cloud was able to to handle her pretty well last year. Hopefully that'll be the same this year as well. Um, what are you thinking? Are you, uh, you picking two wins this weekend for the Huskies? Um, I, I would like to see two wins. Like if we are going to really see ourselves as an eight in the pairwise and above type of team, this is the type of series where we have to go out and take care of business. Um, and I think, you know, kind of riding the high of the Minnesota series. Yeah. I think we can go ahead and get that, uh, taken care of. And I think, yeah, we can get, uh, two wins, um, on the weekend. So I'm going to, I'm going to call a sweep. Um, but I, I could see an overtime result in there in one of the games. Um, but I, I, I think anything less than, uh, four points, I think would be kind of a, kind of a wrench in the system here for the Huskies. Yeah. I th- I'm going to say one, one goal victory and then one, it's like, like a three to two and three to nothing. And the three, nothing's got an empty netter in there. Yeah. If you were Adolski, who's starting Friday. I think he's, I think he likes his routine. So I think he'll go Carico on Friday and a hole on Saturday. Now at the beginning it was a hola um was. on Friday and then Carico. So is this a, a reset to get back to that? It could. You very well could. It might be get out to the finish the rest of the first half with that rotation. Carico on Friday and a hole on Saturday. Depending on how they play, that could change. But then maybe at the beginning mm-hmm. of the, the new year, you can maybe switch it up. But I think he'll for the next two series. I think that's what he's going to go with. I, I'm gotcha. not. I'm. I don't have any inf- inside information. I'm not Jess Myers. Um, I don't uh, talk to the <laughs> coaches sources, community, quote unquote sources. So just a hunch. I can make up sources too. That's right. <laughs> so, um, it's a. Yeah, I would definitely say. Um, If I was a Dalski, I would I would go into the weekend a whole of both games. I wouldn't mind uh, I wouldn't be opposed to that either. Yeah. So that's uh that, that's kind of what I would say. I would say for sure the Friday game, I think he's um uh got that in the or I, I think she's earned that after her performance. Um on on Saturday's game, and especially being out, if she's a hundred percent, then I actually I, no. That I I actually, I'm going to amend my my call. I think you start on you start a hole on Friday, and she shuts them out. You give her the start on Saturday. If she gives up a goal or two, then come back with Carico. But I think start a hole on on Friday and go from there. Base your Saturday mm-hmm. decision on how the game goes on Friday. I'm going to go completely different. My sources tell me yes. that uh, a hole is going to start on Friday. And I think probably for uh, legal reasons, I ha- I would have to say that it was a joke when I was talking about makeup sources and Jess Myers. So Jess Myers, don't sue me, but also do journalism. <laughs> so there that now it's constructive qu- criticism and you can't prove actual malice. So there we go. And that is your journalism law uh, ending um, as we uh, wrap up this podcast. Uh, Zamora did actually just send me a text saying you guys already record. Um, so I'm wondering if he's got any last thoughts um, that, uh, that this is that his opportunity. Kind of if in. he's got a question, do I it. I said winding right down now. now. You got something quick. So um we'll go ahead and do that. If you have a favorite WWE nineties wrestler to compare Abby Murphy to, well, who would you compare her to? You're the, you're the expert on that one. <laughs> I can, I can name a couple, but they're probably not heels. I mean, Dallas diamond page. Wasn't Ooh, a heel. Okay. Was he Kevin Nash? I mean, uh, that, that was diamond Dallas page. What did by I say? The way. Uh, you, I, you said Dallas a, Diamond page. Ah, same difference. Like Lou Diamond Phillips. I think that's um, how I got it mixed up. <laughs> um, and actually, DDP started out as a heel. His whole persona was self high five. So he would pretend to give a high five to a kid and then he would just do it himself and walk away. 
Well, so, so I wasn't and, I wasn't and, wrong then, except and, I butchered his name. But then he's yeah, then he turned face when the whole NWO thing. But he was more like an NWO punching bag, and then Sting would rescue him. And then everyone was afraid of Sting to build up to Sting Hogan. And then obviously it was WCW, so they screwed that all up. And then ended up folding everything with WCW because again, that's Bischoff for you. Duh. So, yeah, that's yeah, Bischoff, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, well, sorry, Eric, get it in next week. Uh, that about does her on this episode of the Husky Sack Podcast. I am, uh, well, the at more clappers, M O A R, more clappers. Andrew, where can we reach you? Andrew at Andrew S E S U H H P for Huskies Hockey Podcast. Let me know if you like those little recap bits. Uh, it's something I had an idea about, but I have no idea how they play. Um, so if you, you're one of your one of our exclusive Boy, listeners, <laughs> very small club. Yeah. But yeah. Dan Jacobson, let me know if you like <laughs> if you like the the Saint Cloud State recaps. If a Bemidji, if a, Bemidji, if a Duluth fan likes the uh, Saint Cloud content, oh. uh, let me know. Hit me up on last. Tw- Last week, actually, Dan Jacobson did bring up that uh, he was wondering if the women uh, were going to be in a little bit of a a hot water um, regarding the uh... Wisconsin rule update. Uh, Because uh, they were uh, the Duluth women were actually only one uh, game above 500 um, as they were sitting in pretty, pretty good in the pairwise. Uh, but they ended up uh, sweeping this last weekend, and I don't think uh, I don't think we have to be worried there about the the Wisconsin rule coming into play. So, I guess I'm not even sure. I mean, I would assume the women's side has adopted the Wisconsin rule, but I guess I'm not 100 percent positive about that because they it, they use a somewhat different system. They use something called NPI yeah. rather than RPI, uh, which I don't see is. I mean, it's a different type of number, but. I think the formula is roughly the same, but it's a I'll little show different. still says pairwise. <laughs> it is still oh. the pairwise, but uh, the, the RPI is all is called the NPI for, for some unique reason. So I don't know if they, if they apply the Wisconsin rule, I would have to think that because it's a smaller field, I feel like it would be an exceedingly small chance for that to happen for a team that's yeah. under 500 to be in the top. Nine, nine, or eight, nine, depending nine. on if a hockey East team is in the top nine of pairwise. So I would, I would think that it's, it's very small chance it could be applied, but I suppose uh, Duluth's not that far off. And as always, it's Duluth. Hey, sneaking hey, in. Two... <laughs> hey, two losses against St. Cloud State will play the Sounder again, right? In, and that in, might, in a, in yeah. Couple. Well, so are, hey, are there are they three games over five hundred now? They're three games over. I think they're what eight and five right now. Right, and if eight five and one. Yep. St. Cloud beats them. That's not going to drop them out of the top eight. You know they're going to lose two games to Wisconsin. I, well, I mean, I'm pretty sure they're going to. They they got this weekend up uh, against Vermont. Who, if there's yeah, any team uh, that's that's worse than scoring than the Huskies, um, it's going to be uh, their. It's, it's going to be Vermont. Duluth Charmin non conference schedule that's going to make the difference for this bit, yeah. unfortunately. So so play somebody, so, Dan Jacobson. <laughs> yeah, Dan Jacobson. So as as but. we're playing Union and Lindenwood <laughs> and Mercyhurst. Mm. Um. You know, speaking of, actually, he did have a question. Would you take Denver or the field for winning the Penrose this season? At this point. Actually, a good question. I think I'd take the field. I think I'd take Denver. I Okay. But it's, like I said, it's a good question because I had to think there. Yep. I think, I think there's. Of the field, who's your team? At this point, it's Western. Um. And, uh, you know, it could be St. Cloud State. If we keep riding posh and he keeps on his streak, um, I think we can be an authority of a lot of sides. I don't think anybody else really scares me um, right now in the um, NCHC. But at the same time, if we don't get the goal scoring figured out, 
it's we're, we're going to end up dropping some points to teams like Miami. Um, so it's, it's that side of it too, but, but I, w- I would say the field um, as of this moment. And Western, if that's your team, they, they just play the one series this year against Denver and that's coming up in Kalamazoo, not this week, but next week I mentioned that show mm-hmm. earlier. I mean, just looking at these schedules, they both play Denver and Western both play Miami four times this year. So no real advantage between one of those two teams based on that, on that, uh, that schedule quirk. So the schedules, I think kind of equal even itself out. So yeah, I, I think I'd still take Denver, um, over the field, but I don't think that's a bad answer. Yeah. Cause I don't know. I do. Do I see Western winning the Penrose? about that it's never happened so maybe that's why it doesn't yeah, strike uh, strike me as as really in play but let's keep that let's let's we'll revisit that at the end of the year we'll see who wins there we'll, we'll Denver wins. or anybody else so, perfect and until next time go huskies Woo. Woo.